Ja, herzlich willkommen. Uh, welcome to again to our uh, joint press conference. Uh, I will have our. Uh, um, I'm Valerio Krüger. I'm, I'm working for the International Society for Human Rights, Internationale Gesellschaft für Menschenrechte. Um, we are working since many decades on human rights violations in Cuba is one of the countries that we are working for a long time. There are a lot of human rights violations happening. And today we will speak about the recent uprising, the recent um, manifestations and uh, what, why and uh, wh what happened. And we will also speak about the situation of political prisoners and um, One important political prisoner for us is um, Luis Frometa Comte. We will talk about his situation. And um, yeah, I might introduce our guests um, for some traveling problems. Uh, Rosa Maria Paya will not be able to attend. Um, but then I would like to introduce John Suarez, the executive director of Center for Refugee Cuba. I would like to say welcome to Lars Rober. Um, he's the political sponsor of the imprisoned German Cuban Luis Frometa Comte, and he's a member of the German parliament. I would like to say hello to Janie Frometa Comte, the daughter of Luis Frometa. Um, and also a very special welcome to Javier Larondo, the president from Prisoners Defenders. And um, also a speaker will be, but I don't know if he's with us already, Gregor Hackmark. Um, if you are there, Gregor, then um, let me know who you are. I don't see your name by now. Yes, auf Deutsch auch nochmal ganz kurz. Ich habe die Namen gerade vorgestellt. Die haben Sie alle in der Einladung gesehen. Um, es gab vor kurzem große äh, Demonstrationen auf Kuba. Und ähm, die Menschen sind wegen einer Versorgungskrise auf die Straße gegangen. Wir werden von John Suarez hören, wie viele Verhaftungen es gab, warum die Menschen auf die Straßen gegangen sind, was die Polizei gemacht hat und ob es weitere Demonstrationen gibt. Dear John, um, what happened in the last weeks? Why did the people decide to, to go on the streets? How many people have been detained? Are there more manifestations? How is the situation right now in the streets of Cuba? Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, and uh, I, I think we need to provide some context. There are still over a, over a thousand political prisoners. Most of them uh, were rounded up in arbitrary detentions, subjected to show trials on July 11th of 2021. Uh, in addition to that, uh, There is a draconian new penal code that has expanded the penalties for engaging in nonviolent protest or for uh, civil disobedience, expression of any sort. 500,000 disaffected Cubans have fled the country in a mass exodus over the last two years. And despite this, mass protests broke out in Santiago de Cuba province on March 17, 2024, initially and spread across the island to Artemisa, Granma, Oguin, Matanzas, and other places. Um, the, these large-scale protests were largely shut down by March 19th, and reports of, arbit ar of arbitrary detentions are being documented. Uh, Javier Larondo's organization, Prisoners Defenders, has reported 32 arbitrary detentions between March 17th, uh, but with the start of the March 17th protest, Uh, citing the largest number arrested being in Oguin with 13, followed by Santiago de Cuba, seven, Havana, four, Cienfuegos, two, and Artemisa, two. These are partial numbers. Um, we know that sporadic protests continue to break out, and the question is why? And the reason is that people are tired after 65 years of the same faces of repression, but in addition to that, there's been a collapse of the Uh, energy grid, the electrical grid in Cuba. So the outages have increased to 17, 18, 20 hours a day. So food is rotting in refrigerators. In addition to that, the regime 
announced and imposed an austerity package at the beginning of March, which raised uh, the cost of gas prices 500, over 500 percent uh, and other costs having a hyperinflationary effect in the country. And that's the reason for the protest. The protests do continue. There has also been a double discourse by the regime trying to claim that they're permitting these protests, but at the same time, that's what they project internationally. Domestically, the official press is describing protesters protesting the blackouts, the food shortages, and mismanagement as lazy, disengaged, and parasites. And we have the case of Victor Manuel Hidalgo Cabrales, although not directly linked to the protest. He put a cartoon on his Facebook page criticizing the power outages, which led to his ongoing detention. And his family's not sure about his uh, condition. His wife put out a video recording describing the series of events that led to their home being surrounded by state security. Uh, in addition to that, Cuban intellectuals on and off the island have been speaking out, calling for nonviolence, calling for the military not to repress Cubans. Uh, the Christian Liberation Movement, a dissident movement based in Cuba, issued a statement on March 20th, uh, calling on the international community to take two concrete actions in response to regime repression. One, the immediate solidarity of the world with the legitimate right of Cubans to live in freedom and prosperity, expressed in concrete actions and not in political rhetoric without direct consequences for the regime. And two, a policy of exclusion and isolation of the Cuban Communist Party uh, regime in response to the continuous repression and segregation by the group in power and the military. Um, they also warn that, that continuing to legitimize and engage with the Cuban government and continuing to accept its logic of imposed blackmail and violence, not taking the people of Cuba as a reference and independent voice, will lead to bloodshed, and once that is underway, it will be too late for the international community to act. But this warning by the Christian Liberation Movement means that they will not be able to say they did not know. With that, I conclude the presentation. That's, thank you. Um, thank you, John, for this quick um, presentation. For all German speakers, I will, help, I will have a very short um, conclusion. Also, wir haben eben gehört, wir hatten auf Kuba, ähm, wir haben in, den, in Kuba in den letzten Wochen eine extreme Krise in vielen Bereichen. Wir haben einen Kollaps der Stromversorgung, teilweise mit bis zu 24 Stunden Blackouts. Äh, wir hatten zu Anfang März die Umsetzung von ähm, extremen Preisanstiegen, im, ähm, zum Beispiel mit über 500 Prozent bei Benzin, 180 Prozent für den öffentlichen Nahverkehr, ähm, und vor diesem Hintergrund sind Menschen auf die Straßen gegangen, haben protestiert. Ähm, einige, die darüber auf Facebook berichtet haben, wir haben sie eben gehört, wurden alleine aufgrund ihres, ihres Facebook-Posts ähm, verhaftet, andere eingeschüchtert. Äh, das ist eine weitere, also eine Strategie, die es seit langem gibt, Menschen äh, festhalten. Genau, und es äh, gibt dann einen Aufruf der christlichen Befreiungsbewegung im CL ähm, am 12. März, der fordert Solidarität mit allen Kubanern, die in Freiheit und Wohlstand leben möchten und Konsequenzen und nicht nur Worte. Und zum Zweiten fordert, ähm, wird gefordert, äh, die kommunistische Partei zu isolieren und ihnen keine politische Legitim Legitimität zu geben. Yeah, um, this, this is the current situation. Um, and now I would like to ask Mr. Rova, German member of the parliament, to speak about um, what he has been doing to help to liberate Luis Frometa Comte. Ähm, lieber Herr Rover, Sie sind der politische Pate von Luis Frometa Comte, der wie Sie aus Dresden kommt. Vielen Dank, dass Sie sich schon seit langer Zeit für ihn einsetzen. Was sind die wichtigen Punkte, die Sie uns mitgeben möchten? Wie haben Sie sich bisher einbringen können und ähm, was steht aktuell weiter an? Also vielen Dank erstmal, dass ich hier mit dabei sein darf und auch äh, vielen Dank für das unermüdliche Engagement aus der Internationalen Gesellschaft für Menschenrechte. 
ähm, zusammen mit allen, die, die, die mit ihnen zusammenarbeiten. Ähm, das ist, glaube ich, eine wichtige Situation, dass wir da so eng beieinander stehen und uns auch mit den Informationen gut austauschen. Das, was gerade mein Vorredner angesprochen hat, ähm, ist in einer einzigen Meldung in den deutschen Medien niedergeschlagen. Ähm, wir haben von diesen Protesten nur etwas online bei tagesschau.de wiederfinden können, wo auch beschrieben worden ist, dass der Strom ähm, für sehr lange Zeit weg ist, ähm, dass das Internet auch sehr bewusst abgeschaltet wird von der, vom System, von der Staatsführung und ähm, dass eben die Menschen wieder auf die Straße gehen, weil es eine absolute Mangelversorgungslage gibt. Warum spreche ich das am Anfang an? Ähm, nicht nur wegen der Dramatik, die wir gerade gehört haben und der Repression gegen die eigene Bevölkerung durch die kubanische Führung, sondern ähm, weil es mich schon auch erschreckt, das Desinteresse äh, in der Öffentlichkeit in Deutschland. Deswegen bin ich gerade der IGFM sehr dankbar und auch anderen Organisationen, die immer wieder auch den Blick auf Kuba lenken. Denn das ist dringend notwendig. Sie wissen, dass wir in der CDU-CSU-Bundestagsfraktion einen Antrag zu Kuba in den Menschenrechtsausschuss eingebracht haben. Aktueller Anlass war die Verhaftung und die Verurteilung von Luis Prometa Comte. Da war ich meiner Fraktion sehr, sehr dankbar, dass wir das tun konnten und damit das Thema auch ins Parlament bringen konnten. Kein Kollege aus dem Deutschen Bundestag kann seitdem sagen, dass er nichts gewusst hat, denn das ist natürlich auch im Deutschen Bundestag in der Debatte und auch im Ausschuss registriert worden. Meine Enttäuschung kommt ein Stück weit daher, dass äh, die Koalition angekündigt hat, äh, einen eigenen weiteren Antrag zu bringen. Den haben wir bis heute nicht gesehen. Ich hoffe, dass vielleicht auch diese Videopressekonferenz nochmal ein Anlass ist, auch den Kollegen aus der Ampel Mut zu machen, das Thema jetzt aufzugreifen. Denn die Lage, die sich weiter zuspitzt auf Kuba, macht es ja deutlich, dass wir hier nicht weiter ignorant wegschauen können. Natürlich gibt es viele Krisen auf dieser Welt, aber Kuba ist eine wichtige Adresse auf dieser Welt, die wir in den Blick nehmen müssen, die, wo wir auch mit der deutschen Außenpolitik agieren müssen. Zusammen mit meinem Kollegen aus Dresden, der in der grünen Fraktion aktiv ist, Kasim Taher Saleh, haben wir jetzt auch gemeinsame Aktionen geplant und gestartet. Wir wollen gemeinsam nochmal in das Auswärtige Amt gehen ähm, und ähm, uns einsetzen, dass es auch Wege gibt, für äh, vom Metacomte rauszukommen, endlich aus diesem Gefängnis. Ähm, aber wenn wir für ihn eine Lösung haben, müssen wir, haben wir noch keine Lösung für die gesamte kubanische Bevölkerung. Und das ist eigentlich die Dramatik. Ich habe... Ähm, im Vorfeld dieser Pressekonferenz mir nochmal die Hinweise auf, dem, auf der Website des Auswärtigen Amtes angeguckt. All die Dinge, die vor mir da kommt, passiert sind, na, machen Sie bitte keine Fotos von Menschenansammlungen, von Polizeieinsätzen. Die sind mittlerweile auch auf der Website kommuniziert. Aber eine direkte Reisewarnung haben wir nicht. Ähm, würde aus meiner Sicht aber dazugehören, damit man eben darauf hinweist, dass es ein Unrechtsstaat ist. Also das sind alles Dinge, die die, die mich irritieren, die mich beunruhigen, wo ich hoffe, mit dem Kollegen Taher Saleh nochmal einen neuen Aufschlag hinzubekommen, auch im Auswärtigen Amt. Ja, Nifo Meta war ja bei ihm und hat es geschildert, es hat ihn sehr beeindruckt ähm, und ähm, er ist da also auch ansprechbar. Ich will jetzt nicht zu viel ähm, nur über mein Engagement für für Meta kommt äh, sprechen. Ich glaube, es wissen alle hier in der Runde, dass wir es geschafft haben, bis zum deutschen Bundespräsidenten, bis zum Bundeskanzler, dass der Fall von Luis von Meta kommt äh, angesprochen worden ist ähm, auf allen Ebenen. Ähm, in der Sache selber werden wir auf diesen offiziellen Wegen ganz sicher nicht vorankommen. Mein Ziel ist dass wir einen humanitären Weg bald finden, dass er aus dem Gefängnis auch unter Wahrung für das Regime, also Gesichtswahrung für das Regime endlich rauskommt. Aber äh, damit ist es für mich eben nicht beendet. Wenn wir das irgendwann geschafft haben, was die große Hoffnung ist, ähm, dann muss es weitergehen äh, mit der Arbeit, äh, sich für Kuba einzusetzen. 
Ja, herzlichen Dank, Herr Hofer. Wir sind Ihnen auch sehr dankbar. Ja, ich erinnere mich an eine Pressekonferenz vor zwei Jahren, wo wir auch schon zu diesem leider traurigen Anlass gesprochen haben. Und Sie haben auch verwiesen auf Ihre Erfahrungen in der DDR und das, was Sie dort erlebt haben, ebenso ein totalitärer Staat. Und von daher umso wichtiger, dass Sie uns auch quasi von damals aus eigener Erfahrung noch mitberichten können. Ich werde das jetzt ganz kurz auch noch mal auf Englisch zusammenfassen für alle, die dabei waren. Es geht schnell. Uh, Vielen very, Dank. <lacht> I will very quickly conclude um, uh, Mr. Rover points. Um, so first of all, he says that it's very important that as we are here together, we share the information on this case and on the cases of Cuba in our um, network of organizations. And then uh, he also stated that it's very important to look on the situation in Cuba. And he was very surprised that there was almost only one big article in Germany about the protests and uh, that we need more awareness. Then uh, he spoke about the proposal of the CDU-CSU party um, um, the two opposition parties, well, the big opposition fraction in the German Bundestag. Um, they had a proposal um, on this human rights situation in Cuba. This proposal was rejected by the government. Um, and, but on the same hand, Mr. Hover stated that every member of the parliament uh, due to this proposal now has to know about the situation in Cuba. So this thanks uh, to Mr. Rova and uh, his other colleagues from CDU, CSU. Um, yeah, and until now, the German government didn't, um, didn't uh, publish an own proposal, which they stated that they would do that. So maybe this conference will be um, help, uh, help for them to again um, remember what they said. Yes. Uh, We had uh, very big and, and important people in Germany covering this case and talking about, for example, the German president and also the German chancellor. But Mr. Rober claims that, uh, says that um, he th thinks that on the official ways, it's not continuing and that there has to be other possibilities, something like a humanitarian mission to help to get uh, Mr. Luis from Metacom to free. Yes, um, this very quickly, as Mr. Rova has to leave very soon our conference, I would like to very quickly ask everybody of you if there is anything that you would like to tell Mr. Rova what um, he and his party should be aware of. Are there any questions or recommend recommendations to Mr. Rova. And if yes, please raise your hand. Yes, John Suarez. John Suarez, it's yours. Thank you, uh, sir. The European Union has been one of the main uh, supporters, subsidizers of the Cuban dictatorship with its PDCA agreement with the regime. Uh, there is a human rights clause. The European Parliament has repeatedly condemned the Cuban government for not keeping its end up of the bargain on the human rights situation. Secondly, we're seeing now that there are thousands of Cubans in Russian uniforms fighting in Ukraine to advance Vladimir Putin's decision to reconstitute the Russian Empire. Do you believe that these uh, circumstances will finally lead the European Union to cut off subsidies to the Cuban regime and follow the recommendations made by the Christian liberation movement to also isolate them from sports events and other uh, activities of polite society due to their outlaw nature. Thank you. Herr Rover, soll ich es noch mal kurz zusammenfassen? Es war exzellentes Englisch, aber ich habe nicht alles verstanden. Ich gebe es zu. Ich fasse mal kurz zusammen. Herr Suarez hat gesprochen über die bisherige ja, Unterstützung mehr oder weniger der EU für das Regime durch die verschiedenen Abkommen, 
ähm, in denen Menschenrechts, äh, Menschenrechte gebrochen werden, die dem Abkommen eigentlich entgegenstehen. Aber die EU unterstützt es weiterhin. Und äh, ob denn jetzt, wo kubanische Söldner in, Ku in Ukraine für Russland kämpfen, ob das ein Weckruf sein kann äh, für die deutsche Regierung und andere, doch endlich diese Unterstützung zu beenden? Also eigentlich müsste es ein Grund sein, aber die Bundesrepublik Deutschland ist hier sehr auf dem diplomatischen Wege unterwegs. Ähm, insofern kann ich die Forderung nachvollziehen, ähm, erlebe aber im Moment das Gegenteil. Wir haben auch keinerlei Informationen bekommen, jedenfalls ist mir nichts über den Weg gelaufen, ähm, dass der Termin, der eigentlich vom UE wo Menschenrechtskommissar auf Kuba geplant war, wie der verlaufen ist, aber stattgefunden hat. Da war für den Herbst was angesagt. Das habe ich ähm, nicht registrieren können, habe ich nichts verfolgen können. Also Sie merken, dass, dass das so alles so ein bisschen unter der Aufmerksamkeitsgrenze läuft. Und das ist das, was mich eigentlich unruhig macht. Auch die, dieser offensichtlich nachweisbare Fakt, ähm, den, äh, der gerade angesprochen worden ist, ist in den deutschen Medien überhaupt nicht präsent, ist überhaupt nicht thematisiert worden. Ähm, das würde ich nochmal mitnehmen. Ähm, ich kann ja auch mal eine Anfrage an das Auswärtige Amt stellen, ob denn solche Dinge bekannt sind und wie sie damit umgehen. Ähm, also das ist eine Anregung, die ich gerne aufgreife. Ich will es mal andersrum formulieren. Wir haben einen neuen deutschen Botschafter auf Kuba. Ich habe einen Botschafterwechsel, der war ganz regulär stattfindend und ich habe den Eindruck, ohne über die, das Engagement der vorherigen Botschafterin kritisch sich zu äußern, das steht mir nicht zu, bin auf dem diplomatischen Parkett nicht so bewandert wie, wie andere, aber ich habe den Eindruck, dass der jetzige deutsche Botschafter in Kuba sehr stringent, sehr bewusst vorgeht und da habe ich auch ein bisschen Hoffnung, dass sich auch diese, dieser Auftritt von Deutschland etwas verändert in Kuba. Das Mikro ist noch aus. Ja, richtig, danke. Um, John, uh, regarding your question, um, Mr. Ruber states that, uh, of course, this should be the call for the German government and others to stop subsidizing uh, the Cuban government. Um, but uh, Germany is on a very diplomatic mission. The approach is very diplomatic, to put it in nice words. Um, and yeah, this leads that he does not expect that there is any significant change. On the other hand, yes, he also did not get the information if there was a specific meeting in the European Parliament with human rights defenders um, on this current issue. So there is no information on that. And also there is not enough awareness in Germany on the situation on Cuba due to the many crises worldwide. And, um, but he will take um, this information of our uh, today's conference and he will, um, he will ask the German foreign offices if and what they are doing uh, regarding this situation. And also he was speaking about the new ambassador to Cuba um, that he hopes um, that he is yeah, continuing a good job, uh, whereas he did not want to um, evaluate the job of the former, former German ambassador to Cuba. Yeah, um, this so far, um, Herr Rover, Sie müssen bald los. Um, you, you are on a way to another date. So, from, thank my, you. Bye -bye. <laughs> from my perspective, thank you very much for joining our conference and uh, we will stay in touch. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Ja, wir haben ähm, über Luis Frometa Comte gehört, ein deutscher Staatsbürger aus Dresden. Und wir werden jetzt mit Javier Ladrondo sprechen, der ähm, sich intensiv mit dem Fall auskennt und sich intensiv damit beschäftigt hat und uns mitteilen kann, was aktuell 
bei den Vereinten Nationen passiert und ähm, welche weiteren Entwicklungen es in dem Fall gibt. Um, I will now um, hand over uh, the microphone to Javier Larondo, who is the president of Prisoners, Defenders. They are working very closely and um, with people in Cuba and have very good statistics on the situation of political prisoners. And he is um, a very deaf expert of the case of Luis Frometa Comte and will share with us um, the, the relevant news of his case um, and what they are doing within the United Nations um, group. Javier. Thank you very much, uh, Valerio. Um, thank you very much the International Society for Human Rights for this press conference in the heartbreaking case of Luis Frometa Comte, as well as Deputy Lars Rower for his support to the family. Let me start by saying that as March as, uh, as March uh, of uh, as of March 25th, uh, we know that Cuba's regime has repressed the protests in numerous cities this month of March, which, like John Swift said, mentioned, although in a less explosive way than uh, those on July 11th, uh, 2021, and are given a balance of around 100 people detained, of which 38 uh, by now have been verified and six of them have been released. Uh, apart from these cases, Cuba has 1,072 political prisoners, a little more than 950 of whom were detained on 11 July uh, 2021. The list of political prisoners, not counting those mentioned from last March, has 115 women, 30 minors, at the age of detention, 226 accused of sedition, among them 17 minors with average sentences of 10 years of imprisonment. 270 people have serious health conditions, like Luis from Atacomte, without any medical treatment, with serious risk for their lives. In addition, all political prisons suffer, suffer mistreatment and torture of various types. The most serious case could be recalled that of Jose Daniel Ferrer Garcia, who is slowly being killed while confined in a punishment cell with sonic torture and lack of medical attention for more than two and a half years, confined in solitary. Luis from Atacomte was arrested on July 17, 2021, without legal justification adjusted to law, other than the alleged peaceful participation of the accused now condemned in the protests or uh, demonstrations against the government that took place on July 12, 2021. He was completely missing for more than eight days, during which time he was in a punishment and isolation cell in prison Cien and Alabo, 100 and Alabo in Havana, where the charges were brought a precautionary measure of provisional, provisional imprisonment was decreed without judicial protection or even knowledge of the case, ordered by the investigating police officer and by the prosecutor, as it is common practice by law in Cuba. And he was subject to interrogations without the presence of a lawyer, being exposed in the process to torture, degrading and inhuman treatment with the aim of obtaining a sort of convention, uh, confession of guilt, the first day of August 2021. Without prior notification, he was transferred to the maximum security Combinado de Leste prison at Havana. The family had no verbal telephone or physical contact for 20 days, at which time he was allowed the first family visit, where the family evidenced that the accused presented a significant deterioration uh, deterioration in his state of health as a consequence of limited, limited medical attention and the insufficiency of medicines to treat his hyper, hypothyroidism and high blood pressure. The accused did not have technical, legal, and independent defense. Even the defense asked for six years of imprisonment for him, which is something surprising from the sentence, 
during his entire criminal process, except for the jurists provided by the government and who depend on the Ministry of Justice, as we have evidence in this complaint and uh, the working group of arbitrary detention um, case that has been previously denounced and uh, that in most cases of this procedure, it was evident that they acted as additional prosecutors, violating his human and procedural rights in a flagrant manner. The procedure uh, at the United Nations is in its fi final phase. Uh, Cuba responded and we replied already. So we expect that within two months, the United Nations will sentence that Luis Frometa Comte is innocent and he has to be released immediately. The dialogue agreement with Cuba, although well-intentioned and well-drafted, has been breached by Cuba, but also by the European Commission. If in the agreement it was key to make Cuban civil society visible and to support it with funds, so far only state-owned companies or associations have been uh, made visible and supported with European funds. It is a scandal. If respect for human rights was a key part of the agreement, Cuba has deployed the greatest repression of the last 20 years, precisely in the years of the signing of the agreement, multi multiplying by 10 the number of political prisoners compared to when the agreement was signed. If the common position did not work, the results of the dialogue agreement are even worse. So we must adopt a firm position in defense and visibility of civil society and human <laughs> rights in Cuba, something that the European uh, Ac Action Service, External Action Service is not currently doing, uh, and take note of the resolutions of the European Parli Parliament, which clearly express the actions that should be carried out. Europe cannot look, cannot look impassively at the crimes against humanity that we are seeing being committed committed in Cuba every day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valeria. Thank you, Javier, for, for your words and for your continuing efforts at the UN um, for doing all that we can within our international legal framework um, to punish those who, who uh, consistently and continuously um, commit crimes against humanity. Um, yes, um, I will now say hello to Rosa Maria Paya. Um, we had her planned as being the first speaker of our little panel today due to some travel uh, challenges. Uh, she's only able to attend for us for a very short time. So, um, uh, Rosa, thank you for making this possible. And um, yes, you are um, the founder of uh, the, the organization Cuba Decide. Um, and you are yourself from Cuba. Um, you're a democracy activist as your father has been. Um, and he is not living with us anymore, which uh, is a very big tragedy. Um, and yeah, you are somehow um, living what he lived and uh, continuing the work to, in to introduce uh, democracy and freedom to Cuba and its citizens. So um, thank you for being with us. Um, what is your organization doing to help um, Cuban civilians, to help Cuba to um, become a democratic society? Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your um, your analysis of the situation and what you can do with your organization and the work. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Valerio. Thank you also to IEF for organizing this uh, this panel. Uh, is uh, it's an honor for me to be uh, among friends and to be addressing um, the the Cuban. Uh, issue in in a, in, a, in such an important, such a pivotal moment as the one that we are uh, living in right now. As you as you may know, uh, thousands of Cubans, maybe hundreds of thousands of them, 
uh, went into the streets uh, during the last weeks, actually, uh, although um, the weekend was the most active uh, uh, moment. I have to say uh, that uh, this is not an isolated um, uh, event. The protests have been taking place on the island for years now, and, and, and the, the before and after was the summer of 2021. Uh, but from uh, July 11, 2021 till now, thousands of protests have taken place on, uh, on the island because um, the Cuban people understand, and, and, uh, and that's my first, um, my first point, and also my first invitation to uh, all those that could be listening to this conversation is to listen to the Cuban people, because the Cuban people understand that uh, to uh, to be able to overcome the huge crisis that have been imposed over them by the Cuban regime, we must get rid of the dictatorship. And that's why each time we see the Cuban people in the streets um, protesting, they have been demanding freedom. Yeah, freedom and food, freedom and electricity, freedom and the possibility to, uh, to be able to, to fight for their lives which, with, with basic uh, human rights, but freedom, because everybody understands that to have a chance to fight for bread, to have a chance to fight to fight for energy, to have a, to have a chance to be prosperous with, the, with, with your own labor, you need, uh, you need to be free. And that's the main um, message, uh, the main demand, and it's also uh, the main call to action to the international community. The call to action is to listen to the Cuban people and to support the Cuban people and not the propaganda that the Cuban regime have been since then uh, exporting to the international community, aiming once again um, to uh, obtain concessions from the, uh, from the international community, from the European Union, and also from the US. The situation on the island is very, very deep. The, the Cuban regime is, uh, is unable to uh, guarantee the most basic services and the Cuban regime will be unable to guarantee those services. That is clear. Um, uh, and and the, if, if you want to help uh, the citizenry, well, it's better that you listen to what the citizens are asking, uh, are asking for. Um, in that regard, um, and addressing your question about what Cuba de Cide as a platform is doing, uh, I have to say that I, I will love, I, I would like to answer this as Cuba de Cide, but also as a member of the opposition and the civil society that have been coordinating with other platforms and other organizations of the opposition and, uh, and, and the civic organizations that work and live on and off, uh, on and off the island, and that uh, and that have uh, achieved uh, a, a, a very important degree of coordination and also of agreement. The most part of us are united uh, uh, under the principles of the uh, agreement for democracy, acuerdo por la democracia. Which establish what are the which are the principles that we all uh, support and are committed to during a transition process. And many of us have uh, have came to uh, have come together to uh, talk in first place to the Cuban people to to tell to the Cuban people and especially those Cubans on the streets that. They are not alone, that the Cuban nation lives on and off the island, that we are the same people and that we are not going to stop till that demand of uh, freedom and, and, and that demand of change towards democracy 
is fulfilled. Uh, in a second instance, we talked to the, uh, to the Cuban military, especially those second and third um, officers that have been commanded to repress the Cuban people. And we have been very clear in uh, inviting them not to be part of the repression, to take side with the Cuban people, to take the side that they belong to, which is the Cuban people. And I hope that, that, that this uh, will multiply not only among the Cuban civic organizations and the Cuban citizens that are already doing that, but also from the part of the international uh, uh, of the international community and to the international community and specifically to Europe because is where we are. We ask um, from you to stop financing the Cuban regime by a, a, and, and and very specifically uh, through the. Uh, cooperation and political dialogue agreement that the European Union has with the Cuban uh, with the Cuban regime. Everybody knows that this agreement has been implemented on a on a temporary fashion, first by uh, uh, Mogherini and now and, and now by uh, by Borrell. This temporary uh, implementation is already illegal. The Cuban regime have been violating that uh, that agreement from the beginning. The Cuban regime violates the democratic clause that is on that agreement, and the European Union is today violating its own law by not suspending that agreement, or at least by not asking for an urgent meeting to. Um, to start a suspension process of that agreement. In addition to that, several nations in Europe have um, voiced their concerns with the agreement. The Lithuanian parliament actually passed a legislation saying that they are not going to ratify this agreement. The um, Sweden government asked for clarification on the violations of the agreement on the part of the Cuban regime, the European Parliament has several times passed resolution demanding the suspension of the agreement and Mr. Borrell is still keeping that agreement in place. When everybody knows that that agreement is sending millions of dollars, millions of euros that belong to the um, European people to the Cuban regime, and that's the same thing to sending those euros to repress the Cuban people or directly to the corruption and the corrupt pockets of the general in power in Cuba. It's time to stop that. It's time to suspend um, the uh, cooperation and political dialogue agreement. All the elements are over the table. There are several avenues um, that could be used to suspend that agreement and to keep that in place today with more than 1,000 political prisoners being tortured on a Cuban jail, with thousands of protests um, taking place uh, uh, in the streets and in the midst of the huge crisis that the Cuban regime has created is simply immoral. So I hope that uh, that the European Union uh, acts on the uh, on this demand that comes actually from uh, from the Cuban people that are risking the most that are risking uh, the the only thing that they have, which is their own bodies and their lives and their freedom and their security to demand freedom on. Uh, on, on the streets. Very, very quickly, I also want to talk about the situation of the political prisoners because um, in the same measure that the citizen mobilizations in the streets and in every forum gets more and more uh, intense, 
and the Cuban regime power gets more and more vulnerable, the uh, vulnerability of those Cubans that are in political prison also increases. The Cuban regime is used the bodies of the political prisoners as hostages. They, they have been actually uh, torturing uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, of the political prisoners, as it was the case of Julian Masola uh, in, in, in Havana during the protest and after the protest, sending a message of what they can do and they are willing to do if, uh, if this mobilization continues. The same thing with Jose Daniel Ferrer, which is actually at risk of death Right now, Jose Daniel Ferrer has been in an, ice, in an isolation cell for since he is in prison, since uh, August um, 2021. Uh, his body has deteriorated in a very critical way. And, uh, and, and, and his situation, his life is today just non-compatible with the political prisoner uh, prison and with the uh, uh, with the jail uh, regime that he has been submitted to. So to save the life, the life of Jose Daniel Ferrer, we should demand his immediate liberation. And that means that the European Union that actually has a leverage should use it to condition any, any deal with the Cuban regime to the liberation of the political prisoners, to, to the recognition of all fundamental rights in Cuba, and to, uh, the, uh, and to force the Cuban regime to submit to the will of the people and leave, because that's the uh, demand of the Cuban, uh, of the Cuban people. Uh, I believe that is about time that uh, the democracies of the world uh, get together to support uh, the demand uh, for freedom and the right to democracy of the Cuban people. We are not asking any favors here. And I want to be very clear because I know that this, that, that phrase is, um, is, is, is a strong one. But when we talk about freedom and democracy in Cuba, we are talking about removing uh, from the island of Cuba, uh, a regime that has been destabilizing democracies for the last six decades. When we, when we ask help from the European Union, we're actually asking them to, to act to stop a regime that has been actively supporting the war of aggression of Russia in Ukraine, a regime that have been that have been facilitating the enrollment of young Cubans on the Russian army to go to the Ukrainian front, a regime that have been actively supporting the Cuban the the, the Putin regime diplomatically and changing the votes of many states, especially Latin American and, and African states, on United Nations, a regime that have been using all its propaganda power and all the, all the media agencies that they control or own to cut and paste Russia today. So that while the European Union have a ban on Russia today, well, they do not have a ban on Cuba Vision Internacional and Cuba Vision Internacional have been copying and pasting what Putin wants Europeans to uh, um, to know Rosa when we Mar talk about supporting uh, the Cuban regime, and I and, and I will be and I will be finishing right now. When we talk about supporting the Cuban, when, when we talk about supporting the Cuban people to stop and to change that regime towards a democracy, what we are actually asking for the world and for uh, uh, and, and and from Europe specifically is to uh, protect their best interest. So I, I hope that, that 
Europe and, uh, and the rest of the democracies understand the urgency and the convenience of uh, taking sides with the Cuban people at this moment. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Rosa Maria. Uh, very, very um, <clears throat> strong points and a very strong call for world democracies to act and to listen to the Cuban people that the only thing that they have and that they offer is their bodies, their physical well-being that they are able to um, invest during this manifestations. Thank you, Rosa Maria. And um, I will now like to ask Janie Frometa Comte. She is the daughter of um, Luis Frometa Comte. And um, yes, Janie, you have been listening to all these statements. What can you share with us as daughter? What do you ask um, the world, the politicians, and what uh, is the situation of your father right now? Was ist die Situation von deinem Vater aktuell und was kannst du uns mitgeben? Was sollen wir bedenken in unserer Arbeit? Wenn du das vielleicht in zwei, drei Minütchen schaffst. Ja, ich werde mich kurz halten. Ähm, ja, erstmal danke, dass ich, äh, dass du mich mit eingeladen hast und dass du gerade in diesem Moment diese Konferenz ins Leben gerufen hast. Wir wissen alle, dass die Situation auf Kuba äh, wieder schlimmer ist, äh, dass es wieder vermehrt Stromausfälle gibt. Jetzt gab es die schlimmen Unwetter, noch mehr Gründe für Stromausfälle und so weiter, kein Essen. Ähm, es ist immer wieder wichtig, auf die Situation in Kuba aufmerksam zu machen. Und ich würde gerne die Worte von Herrn Rover noch mal ähm, aufnehmen. Er hat gesagt, und es ist auch richtig, dass wir hier in Deutschland so wenige Informationen von Kuba erhalten und dass er zum Beispiel nicht mal wusste, dass ähm, Kuba Russland im Krieg gegen die Ukraine unterstützt mit Soldaten. Ähm, das sind alles, das sind wichtige Sachen, die wir ähm, für unsere Arbeit hier unbedingt ähm, verstärken, verstärken müssen. Einfach das Bewusstsein der Menschen ähm, verstärken für die schlimme, schlechte Situation auf Kuba. Ähm, ganz kurz zu meinem Papa. Er ist natürlich das Beste und das für uns und bei mir natürlich das schlimmste Beispiel für Menschenrechtsverletzungen auf Kuba. Ähm, sicherlich haben es die meisten von euch äh, selber mitbekommen. Im Ende November wurde unser Papa schwer misshandelt von anderen Gefangenen im Gefängnis. Ihm, er wurde schwer zusammengeschlagen. Man hat versucht, seine Nase abzuschneiden. Also so schlimm das auch klingt. Er war anderthalb Monate auf der Krankenstation und ähm, Jetzt ist es wieder so, also die auf der Krankenstation heißt, das ist die nötigste Versorgung. Er hat seine eigenen Schmerzmittel genommen, die wir ähm, in diesem Moment mit der äh, deutschen Botschaft nach Kuba geschickt haben. Ähm, eigenes Verbandsmaterial und so weiter. Also in Kuba wird da nichts im Gefängnis zur Verfügung gestellt oder nur das Allergeringste. Und jetzt ist wieder die Situation, dass er keine medizinische Versorgung erhält. Er klagt über schwere Schmerzen in seinem Armen, in den Knochen und man stellt ihn einfach nicht bei einem Arzt vor. Und wenn er bei einem Arzt vorgestellt wird, das ist jetzt schon zum wiederholten Male, dann ist es so, dass dieser Arzt nicht da ist oder dass dieser Arzt nicht existiert. Ja, was ich ähm, oder wofür ich sehr dankbar bin, weil das ist eine sehr schwere Arbeit und ich weiß, dass das auch Prisoners, Defenders, Kuba, Desida, ähm, all diese Organisationen, ähm, auch ihr, die IGFM, es ist so schwer, Menschen zu erreichen. Es ist so schwer, ähm, die, die Augen zu öffnen. Ja, gerade auch in Deutschland für ein Land, was so weit weg ist von Deutschland. Und wir dürfen da nicht aufhören. Wir müssen da weitermachen. Und ich erwarte von der Politik, dass auch mal Konsequenzen gegenüber Kuba ähm, ja, eingereicht werden sozusagen. Also zum Beispiel Sanktionen gegenüber Kuba. Jetzt gerade in der aktuellen Situation wieder werden Menschen festgenommen. Ich kann es nicht verstehen. Nur weil die auf die Straße gehen und sagen, ich, ich habe Hunger und ich möchte Strom. Ja, das sind, das sind Menschenrechte. Und dafür kommst du ins Gefängnis. Und da muss die EU handeln, Deutschland handeln. Und ja, Unsere Aufgabe ist es immer wieder, den Menschen auch die Augen zu öffnen 
No Travel to Kuba ist auch ein ganz wichtiger ähm, Fakt, damit dieser Diktator endlich mal endgültig das Geld ausbleibt, weil die Touristen bringen das Geld nach Kuba. Und das ist auch eine wichtige Sache. Da haben wir auch eine Petition ins Leben gerufen und ähm, wir wollen an die Reiseveranstalter, an die Fluggesellschaften herantreten und sagen hier, auch ihr habt eine Verantwortung. TUI als Beispiel, Condor. Wir haben alle eine Verantwortung gegenüber Kuba, den Menschenrechten und dem kubanischen Volk. Und ja, mein Herzenswunsch ist es, die Freiheit aller politischen Gefangenen, La Libertad para todos los presos in Kuba und natürlich para mi papá, für mi papá, para mi tío, mi tío también está um, preso. Also mein Onkel ist auch gefangen, Alto, Delgado Romero. Ja, und ihr merkt, es fällt mir schwer, weil es ist einfach, ich bin traurig darüber und ich kann es einfach, die Situation nicht verstehen. Jenny, vielen Dank. Danke. Jenny, vielen Dank. Ich übersetze ganz, ganz schnell wesentliche Aspekte ins Englische. Um, I will translate very quickly Jenny's points. Um, so the situation right now is even worse. And uh, also citing Deputy Rohrer, um, we have not enough information about Cuba here in Germany. We don't have as much information that there are Cuban soldiers fighting for Russia in the genocidal war. Um, in the case of her father, she um, is she was talking that uh, he was treated, he was punished uh, by the end of November very badly. Uh, he was, um, yeah, um, he was conducted, there was conducted uh, torture on him. They even tried to cut off his nose. He is right now on a um, hospital station, which is not a hospital, and uh, there is even no um, um, no medication that he's receiving. The only thing he's receiving is by funds that were sent to him um, via the German embassy. Um, and if there is to be, and if there should be, or if there uh, they call um, that there should be, a, uh, um, that he, he will see a medic, then this doctor is not there or um, yeah, cannot share and cannot have a time for him. Um, what is what is she asking the organization? She's asking. Um, she's saying it is it is difficult to uh, raise awareness on this topic, um, and she asks us and thanks us for the work that the different organizations do, and asked us to continue that. And uh, she asked the politicians. Uh, specifically the German government, but also the European Union to um, be to, to be clear and to not only talk, but also to um, implement consequences uh, against the Cuban regime so they cannot continue this repression. And she was also, she was also talking about her um, petition, which is called No Travel to Cuba. Um, she is also claiming that it's a responsibility of the tourism agencies to not travel to Cuba. They have a responsibility also for um, the people's lives in Cuba. Yes, very quickly, your points. Thank you, Janie. Thank you, Janie. Um, as we are already on one hour of time, and yes, John, we will share everything uh, here. And if you have this, Janie, you can share the link to the petition here in the group chat. Um, there were two questions, one from um, Jade and Tobias Käufer, and we still have Gregor Hackmark talking to us. Um, I would like for the time uh, being already four, I would like to um, first, have our two questions, and uh, Gregor, uh, then I will also give the mic to you. Um, now, in the order, uh, first person was Jade. Jade, please um, unmute your phone, and um, you have a question for us. Please keep it short and address the person you want to ask. Um, hallo, ich weiß nicht, ob ich auf Deutsch oder Spanisch sprechen soll. Was ist besser zu verstehen für die meisten Leute hier? 
Also ich wäre einfach Spanisch. Ich Gut. mache nur generell. Leider, dass der, der Ruhe weg war, weil meine Frage war direkt an ihn. Mache ich weiter auf Spanisch. Ich ähm, pertenezco a dos organizaciones que tienen comunicación con europeos, eh, europarlamentarios. Y entre la comunicación siempre hay una oración donde se plantea que a Cuba no se puede aislar. Eso es una respuesta de, de los europarlamentarios, eh, entre ellos el, el presidente de la sesión de, eh, de acción exterior del Parlamento, el eh, Herr eh, Macalista. Eh, no, es de eh, con de, el Servicio de Acción Exterior. Eh, eh, esta oración me llama la atención porque hay muchas organizaciones, aquí veo algunos colegas que también están en organizaciones, que eh, hacemos manifestaciones y que estamos eh, eh, sumergidos en el tema Cuba. La oración es, a Cuba no se puede dejar sola. Es, eh, ¿Qué queremos decir a los políticos? Que el pueblo de Cuba ya está solo. Mientras que los políticos sigan hablando con eh, los dictadores del PCC de Cuba, el pueblo de Cuba continuará solo. Dejar al pueblo de Cuba solo lo están haciendo ya. Mientras tanto, haya acuerdos con el, el desgobierno de Cuba, con la dictadura. Haya eh, diálogos, haya visitas donde, como de los altos representantes, que no llevan a nada. Eso es dejar al pueblo de Cuba solo. Ayudar al pueblo de Cuba es dejar de entrar organizaciones no gubernamentales, que las ayudas lleguen directamente al pueblo y demás. Lo que están haciendo ahora, están ayudando al pueblo de Cuba, a ninguna esfera política, ni de Alemania, que es el país donde vivo, ni a, por parte del Parlamento Europeo. Ese no es el verdadero pueblo de Cuba. Ese es un grupo que tiene el poder secuestrado y que tiene al pueblo sometido a dictadura. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Thank you. Gracias por su statement. Um... I will now ask um, Tobias Käufer. Um, yes, and also we have um, the team member of Mr. Rova. She shared the email address of Mr. Rova's office. Uh, anybody who has questions can directly um, write to this email address. Um, Yare, if you can, exactly. Very good. Okay, uh, Tobias Käufer, um, Auslandskorrespondent für die Welt, für noch einige andere uh, Formate. Um, Sie sind lange schon unterwegs zu Lateinamerika. Um, ich freue mich auf Ihre Frage. Ja, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Uh, leider muss ich das uh, bestätigen, dass uh, das Interesse an der Situation in Kuba in deutschen Medien überschaubar ist. Man kämpft da immer für jeden Platz, für jede Zeile, leider nicht immer erfolgreich. Woran das liegt, kann ich Ihnen auch nicht so genau sagen, aber ja, man muss einfach weitermachen. Ich habe mal eine Frage an die Tochter des inhaftierten Häftlings in Kuba. Und zwar möchte ich gerne wissen, es gab im letzten Jahr den Versuch von Papst Franziskus, dazu zu, zu appellieren, die Leute, die Verhafteten in Kuba freizulassen. Er hat gesagt, ähm, man müsste die jungen Leute wieder zurück ins Leben holen. Und es wäre wichtig, ähm, ja, da ein Zeichen zu setzen. Und das wurde dann auch auf einer gemeinsamen Pressekonferenz äh, mit Vertretern der Regierung ähm, kundgetan. Ich würde gerne mal wissen, ob die Familie irgendwann mal im Nachgang davon noch mal etwas gehört hat, ob die Kirche mal Kontakt aufgenommen hat, ob sie zur Kirche Kontakt aufgenommen haben und wie da die Situation ist. Ja, also ich weiß gar nicht, inwieweit ähm, Sie das wissen. Als ich damals auf Kuba war, war ich ja auch direkt beim ähm, Nunzius. Das ist ja sozusagen der Vertreter des Papstes in, in, jeweils in den einzelnen Ländern. Ähm, hat mich dort persönlich vorgestellt mit dem Schicksal von unserem Papa, auch in, in Bezug natürlich auf die ähm, auf alle politischen Gefangenen. Und damals wurde mir eben gesagt, ja, das wird immer wieder an den Papst herangetragen. Dann gab es eben diese ähm, Situation mit dem, äh, mit dem Papst, dass er da auch persönlich ähm, die Situation angesprochen hat zu den politischen Gefangenen. Aber ja, ähm, das ist wohl, ich, ich weiß, nicht, weiß es nicht, da ist nichts mehr passiert. Also es wurde angesprochen, es war in den Medien, der Papst 
bittet um die Freilassung ähm, der politischen Gefangenen, aber ähm, es viel ist danach scheinbar nicht mehr passiert. Was allerdings, also wir haben jetzt direkt ähm, von dem Papst oder ich kein Feedback mehr bekommen, aber ähm, wir haben dann äh, zusammen mit dem Herrn Rover haben wir mit der Kat äh, Quatsch mit der evangelischen Kirche ähm, eine Aktion gestartet, dass äh, wir, weil das war mir auch sehr wichtig, ähm, dass zumindest wenigstens ein äh, Vertreter der Kirche regelmäßig meinen Papa besuchen kann im Gefängnis. Ja, ähm, aber auch da gibt es von kubanischer Seite her gar keine Reaktionen drauf. Also auf diese Bitte, das ist ja nur eine Bitte, dass ähm, der Pfarrer äh, einer Kirche unserem Papa für einfache Gespräche äh, für die Seele, ja, für die Seelsorge äh, besuchen kann. Aber das ist nicht gewollt, das wird abgeblockt, keine Ahnung. Also ganz schwierige Situation, egal auf welchem Weg man es probiert. Ja. Ja, danke schön. Um, I will translate very quickly. Um, Tobias Käufer, he's a journalist uh, working on Latin America, and um, his point is that uh, he can he can state also that there is not enough awareness on Latin America on Cuba in German media, and, and he does not know why. Um, he had a question regarding uh, on to Janie if there was appeal to the Pope. Uh, Pope Franciscus um, to release all political prisoners in Cuba. What happened with this appeal, uh, with this uh, um, yeah, action? Um, and then Janie said that there was a meeting or a, a conversation with the nuncius in Cuba, but later on there was nothing heard of this conversation uh, if there were anything political decisions following these talks. So uh, for now, they have no feedback from the Pope or other state organizations or the church in Cuba. Um, I see that we have two more questions, but I would like now to ask Mr. Uh, Gregor Hackmark to um, talk to us. Um, I don't know, Mr. Hackmark, if English or German is better for you. Um, what have you been experiencing? You um, as, a, as the executive director of INIT, a, a platform for worldwide petitions. Yes, um, thank you. I'm going to start in English and then I can translate for myself as well. And I try to be very short due to the long time we've, we are in this call already. So INIT is a petition platform and we've been supporting Gianni and uh, Maria, the daughters of Luis, since uh, July last year, uh, June last year, the petition started on the 26th of June, and we helped them with the text and the picture um, and helped to mobilize more than 16,000 people. I just shared the link in the chat, so please save the link and also share it among your network. And we really tried to raise the awareness of this case and was quite successful in the beginning. We got this on a local TV station, MDR, Mitteldeutscher Rundfunk that actually reported and summed up the case really well. Um, we also came, uh, I think, to a small demo in front of the consulate, made a little video for social media, and also went with the petition starters uh, to the foreign ministry. Um, unfortunately, they didn't want to receive the petition in public yet, but I think that's going to be the next step. And I also love the idea of Las Rova that, you know, like the, we will try it again and they, they issue a, a, a travel warning to Cuba because I think that could be some economic pressure um, definitely to be discussed. Um, and um, yeah, basically our role as a petition platform is to support petition starters like we do in this case. We've done uh, a few cases in the past, not in, in not in Cuba, to be honest, um, but it's always very difficult to raise awareness for political prisoners, but there are ways to get them out. I mean, if there is enough of the pressure. So I'm very optimistic um, and definitely we should not stop and just continue and don't don't lose the hope here. So um, als deutsche Übersetzung ganz kurz, Gregor Hackmark ist mein Name von der Petitionsplattform INIT. Wir begleiten Gianni und Maria als PetitionsstarterInnen schon seit dem 26. Juni letzten Jahres ähm, und haben geholfen äh, mit Bild und Text und der Mobilisierung für die Petition. Mittlerweile haben 16.755 Menschen unterschrieben. Das ist schon echte Menge, die sich hinter diesen Fall stellen 
und ähm, eben auch die Freilassung fordern und auch vor allen Dingen noch mehr fordern vom Bundeskanzler, dem Auswärtigen Amt, auch dem Bundespräsidenten sich einzusetzen für Luis und seine Freilassung. Und ähm, wir haben auch schon eine Menge erreicht. Es gab einen, einen Fernsehbeitrag im lokalen Fernsehen MDR, Mitteldeutscher Rundfunk, der den Fall sehr, sehr gut zusammengefasst hat, ein paar Zeitungsartikel. Wir waren auch bei einer Mahnwache vor dem Konsulat, äh, vor dem, ähm, Konsulat von Kuba hier in Berlin dabei, Social-Media-Videos dazu gemacht. Und wir haben auch ähm, die PetitionsstarterInnen begleitet zum Auswärtigen Amt. Aber ähm, gerade wie das in solchen Fällen leider oft üblich ist, wir kennen das aus der Vergangenheit, wo wir auch Petitionen begleitet haben für politisch Gefangene, teilweise auch mit Erfolg. Ähm, das ist immer ein Marathon, das ist kein Sprint und man muss da wirklich geduldig immer wieder dranbleiben, immer wieder Anlässe schaffen, den Druck erhöhen. Und ich finde den Vorschlag von Lars Rowe auch sehr gut, auch ähm, auf den wirtschaftlichen Aspekt einzugehen und zum Beispiel eine Reisewarnung der Bundesregierung zu fordern, ähm, damit sozusagen Kuba hier endlich reagiert und äh, Luis freilässt als Symbol dafür, dass es natürlich auch viele andere politische Gefangene gibt, die eben, ebenfalls einer Freilassung bedürfen auf Kuba. Vielen Dank, Herr Hackmark. Thank you, Mr. Hackmark, for your support and uh, for your endeavors uh, and for being uh, and for joining and um, helping with the petition that already was signed by 16.000 people. Um, we will also share this from our organization to reach, get more reach. As we are already late in time, there were two more questions. Um, I would like to, to ask both of you. We have Felipe and Santiago. Um, please, very quick questions. And please tell us who you want to answer or if it's open, just a quick question. Felipe. Felipe, you have to unmute yourself, please. Please unmute your microphone. And please also tell us if you're from an organization or if you're a journalist, please tell us uh, what your background is quickly. Ja, hallo. Können Sie mich jetzt hören? Ja, sehr gut. Hi. Hallo, perfekt. Okay, erst einmal danke für die IG, also IGFM, für alle, was Sie tun, nicht nur für die Menschenrechte in, in Kuba, sondern weltweit. Und eigentlich, was ich sagen wollte, geht eigentlich an den, als den, an den deutschen Politiker. Also erst einmal, ich bin Felipe von Dora, ich komme aus Kuba, ich bin ein Kubaner Deutscher, die schon seit 15 Jahren in Deutschland wohnt. Und ich agangiere mich ein bisschen so viel, wie es geht für die Situation oder die aktuelle Lage in Kuba oder die Lage schon seit ein paar Jahren in Kuba. Also der Herr Lars äh, äh, Rowe, er, also man muss eigentlich hören, was die Politiker sagen. Also er, sag, also er ist auf unserer Seite, er versucht uns zu helfen, aber er redet über Hoffnung. Er hofft, dass die Botschafter, also der neue Botschaft, deutsche Botschaft in Havanna, er hofft, dass dass jetzt sich was ändert. Es ist alles nur eine Hoffnung. Es ist alles nur eine... Also, das sehe ich hier nicht unbedingt. Also, in Deutschland haben wir noch nicht einen Politiker, entweder von der CDU oder andere Partei, die wirklich uns helfen möchte und die, die also sagen wir so, mit die, mit die... Also, die sich positionieren möchte, so wie die Situation es benötigt. Also, die, die Lage in Kuba ist kritisch, und die Politiker hier reden äh, einfach nur über Hoffnung, sagen, dass sie tun ihre Besten, aber am Ende bin ich andere, also ich bin andere Meinung. Also ich bin die Meinung, dass entweder diese Politiker oder andere, mit denen ich schon auch Kontakt hatte, mit denen ich auch schon mehrmals diskutiert habe, persönlich, äh, ich kenne schon die Meinung in echt von diesen Leuten. Die verteilt, also heute hat er gesagt, dass dass die Botschafterin in Havanna, also die, die nicht mehr jetzt ist, er ist niemand, um sie zu kritisieren. Als ich vor ein paar Jahren ihn gefordert habe, sie zu kritisieren, hat er aber auch nicht gemacht. Also es ist alles nur ein Spielchen irgendwie. Und eigentlich wollte ich nur sagen, dass für uns Kubaner muss klar sein, wir sind alleine in diesem Kampf. Wir haben niemanden, der uns wirklich so richtig helfen möchte, weil die deutschen Politiker vertreten erst einmal ihr Interesse, ihre politischen Interessen in Deutschland. Und die kubanische Community in Deutschland, äh, es ist so wenig, dass wir ja politisch eigentlich nicht so viel bewegen werden. So, was an dem Thema die deutsche Botschaft und die neue Botschafter, ich sehe nicht, also ich bin anderer Meinung als diese deutsche Politiker, 
Ich sehe nicht, dass der neue Botschafter andere Vision hat, andere Idee hat. Wenn ich mich angucke, und das mache ich schon seit Jahren, beobachte die Facebook-Seite von den Botschaft, also die deutsche Botschaft in Havana, sehe ich keine Veränderung. Es geht immer noch weiter zu motivieren, deutsche Invektor in Kuba zu investieren. Es geht immer noch kulturellen äh, äh, Tausch irgendwie zu fordern. Aber es gibt, also er hat sich nicht geändert und wie er sich nicht ändern mit diesen neuen Botschafter. Und Ora, haben Sie, haben Sie eine konkrete Frage? Äh, also, nee, also wie gesagt, meine Frage war ja an der Politiker, die weg ist und er ist nicht mehr jetzt da, aber was ich, also ich wollte nur sagen, dass, also danke für alles, was Sie tun, aber ich sehe nicht, dass mit diesen Leuten, die uns versuchen, uns zu helfen, wirklich wir weiterkommen. No. Gut, danke für Ihr Statement, für Ihre Meinung. Um, I will quickly, very, very quickly translate. Uh, Felipe von Dora, he is a Cuban um, living in Germany for 10 years or 15 years. And um, he is criticizing, uh, apparently, um, many politicians claim that they want to do something, but they don't. And um, he was asking um, also uh, Mr. Rova, um, or he was criticizing him because many years ago he asked him to criticize the German ambassador. Uh, apparently he didn't. This I cannot confirm because I have no information on that. And um, yes, uh, he said that the Cuban people are alone um, and that, that they don't have anybody. I guess that many others of you here would like their position on that. Um, but yes, thank you, Felipe. Uh, Dankeschön. And now I would like to give the word to Santiago, Santiago Alpizar. Thank you very much. My, uh, um, my name is Santiago Alpizar, an attorney here in Miami. I'm also the vice president of an organization named Cuba Demanda. I had two members of my organization also in this uh, conference, Yale, Bravo, Marita de Sao. Thank you for that. And thank you, John Suarez and Maria Rosa Maria Baya for your statement. I know I'm not going to ask any question. I, I would like to place our position as a organization that is registered in the transparency registry of the European Union. We had the, uh, the opinion, we had um, our activity will be focused in the uh, suspension of the PDCA. We believe the PDCA is not working for Cuba. And we had to bring our claim before the exterior committee action of the European Commission. And also it is necessary before the European Court of Out. Uh, we also encourage people in, uh, in Europe, now that uh, the, this coming election, to vote for all those uh, people in the Euro Parliament that support the Cuban cause, the real Cuban cause. No more hypocrisy. We would like to change the, the, the opinion that the European Union have uh, uh, about Cuba, considered like a special case of, of democracy of one only of only one party. That's ridiculous. And we are going to make our claim all the way through until we decide until we uh finally get our answer, which is a free Cuba. Thank you very much. Thank you, San Diego, San, San Diego, Santiago, for, for your statement and for again claiming uh, very strongly to stop the PDCA. Yes, um, John Suarez. Uh, a question and a brief statement. One, I was trying to sign the init petition, but the country tab would not allow me to go down beyond the A's. Um, I did it with Opera and also with Mozilla. I wonder if there's a preferred browser. And that's, of course, for Gregor. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's usually Google Chrome, but um, I'll leave a contact if you have, if you discovered a bug that we can look into that. Okay. And then the second issue I just want to briefly mention, because it was the presentation I was going to give, is that the Cuban government has a six decade track record of collaborating, providing logistical military aid to terrorist groups, in fact, even creating terrorist groups such as the ELN, the M19 in Latin America, but they've also worked consistently with Hamas, Hezbollah, and also cooperated with state sponsors of terrorism like North Korea, Syria, Iran. In the case of North Korea, they 
Cuba violated international sanctions in 2013 when it was discovered that they were shipping tons of weapons, including uh, surface air missile technology, ballistic missile technology, to North Korea in a freighter uh, where those military supplies were hidden under bags of sugar. And this also included entire MiG jets. Uh, the UN investigated and they found that that was in violation of international UN sanctions, but this was at the time that Obama was uh, engaging and they talked with Cuba, so it was not they were not held accountable. And we know that this past year, 2023, they had high-level meetings with Hamas in February of 2023 and visits of the Iranian foreign minister and the Iranian president to Cuba in the early part of the year to Havana. And in December, uh, Diaz Canel, the president of Cuba, visited Iran, and they have been cooperating closely with Iran since 1979. The same holds true with Syria, which points out to the hypocrisy of the regime. The Assad regime, father and son, have engaged in wholesale slaughter against groups in Syria, but more recently against Palestinians. And the Cuban government had blocked efforts to hold the Syrian regime accountable in the early 2010s. I just wanted to touch on that briefly. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, yes, um, that's definitely an issue that we see. And we as a human rights organization um, can also support or support this um, statement that we see that the governments of terror regimes are working closely together. Uh, Cuba is supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, the mullahs in Iran. They are working and we're shipping missiles to North Korea. Uh, now we have uh, Cubans fighting for Russia uh, in Ukraine. And that's also something that we always point out to the German politicians and the government that uh, appeasement policy it will not work anymore. Um, we have the same case with Russia where we had appeasement for many years. Uh, we have this in Iran right now. We have this with Cuba. This will not work. And yes, Michael Lee, journalist in Berlin, um, he just raised his hand. Michael, um, your ja. question, deine Frage. Danke, bin ich zu hören? Ja. Ja, danke, wenn ich noch kurz etwas an den John Suarez äh, fragen darf, ja? Ähm, dear John, uh, we are following us on Twitter, on X, yes, yeah, so very happy to see you. Uh, I'm interested in the number of Cubans who fled uh, Cuba in the last two years. I've read the number of 200,000. Uh, is this uh, number correct? And the second question, um, how do the American authorities treat the Cuban refugees when they reach the Florida or the Mexican-American border? Do you have uh, uh, some uh, demands how to treat the Cuban refugees? If they send, uh, for example, the Bolsaros who try to flee over the sea, they bring them back to Cuba. What happened to the refugees when they come back to Cuba? Do they get punished? The, the situation is apparently, the latest number I've seen over the last two and a half years is actually 500,000 Cubans that have uh, entered the US. Um, the bulk of them, what's happened is with the Biden administration, they did open up quite a bit initially and that has encouraged more to come in. But also uh, what has happened is Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua have been coordinating efforts to weaponize migration. So it's not just the Cubans. There's also a large number of Nicaraguans that have come in, large number of Venezuelans, and it's in the millions, in addition to other nationalities. But those are overrepresented. The Biden administration uh, last year came out with a new policy which restricted the ability of Cubans, Haitians, and I'm trying to remember if it was, I think it was Venezuelans, which were the third country, to be able to apply for asylum uh, on U.S. soil. They had to do it from their homeland in violation of uh, international treaties the U.S. has signed. In addition to that, we do know, we do have reports of people being returned to Cuba uh, many banceros, uh, and also being subjected to reprisals by the regime. 
and equal and something that was quite disturbing in uh, November of 2022, a group of Cuban migrants were attacked by a Cuban Coast Guard boat and had their boat sunk and a number of them killed. And the U.S. Embassy in Havana repeated the same narrative of the regime, which was trying to portray it as an accident, not as something premeditated, despite the statements by the survivors. So that's something, obviously, that raises our concerns with regards to the United States. Thank you, John. And um, yes, um, due, due to our time, uh, we are already on 1 hour 30. I would like to, to end with our conference. Um, Santiago, I saw that you have a question raised. I would like to maybe, maybe you can send me your question on email and uh, I will try to, um, we will try to include this. Or if you have something very important and short, then do it. And unmute, unmute, unmute your phone, please, your microphone. Well, it's in, um, regarding the question about how many Cubans and how restricted they are here in the United States, I remind everyone that I'm an immigration lawyer here in the United States. So I know exactly what John, John Suarez has said. There is almost half a million people who have fled the communist Cuba in the last two years. And unfortunately, uh, the Department of Security here, the, not the, the Homeland Security has not been providing the, uh, the right tools to the Cubans to apply for political uh, refugee or, or political asylum within the United States according to the Cuban uh, adjustment law. Cubans have a special law, a privileged law, because we are coming from the communist country. That law has been subverted, and now Cubans that cross the border are giving a simple piece of paper to allow only them to apply for political asylum. When in the past we were, they were paroled, and immediately after they can apply for a, a, a work permit, and immediately after one year to adjust the status to a permanent resident of the United States. That's a sad situation that we are confronting now with the Cuban refugee. Thank you, Santiago. And yes, thank you to you all. I would like to close our conference now. Um, if everything works, we will be happy to share with you this conference recorded. Uh, we will send you the YouTube link and uh, so you can share this with your networks. Thank you very much for everybody. Vielen Dank an alle Teilnehmer und Teilnehmerinnen für alle Beiträge. Uh, we will work closely together for Free Cuba. And um, yes, thank you all. Um, einen schönen Nachmittag. Uh, have a nice day or evening, wherever you are. Goodbye.